Hello, hello. Sorry, guys. Just was setting some stuff up here, getting the project ready for you guys today. Come on. Lena, number one. What's up, Lena? How are you today? Let me create a new comp here. Let's make this Oh, wait. I'm doing good today. We had um we had my workplace Halloween party. We do it during work sometimes and it was pretty cool. It was very small this year, but very very fun, you know. Nothing like ending the day. It's like I'm sure you guys will remember, obviously, because you guys just, you know, gotten out of school, high school and stuff. But, you know, like when you come in and there's like a substitute teacher and you know your day is going to be chill or you're like movie day today. Those days are the best days in class. Um, and that's how I felt like work was today, like almost like a movie day, like a chill day. Um, but let's go ahead and kind of just get into the lesson today because we've, we've got a lot to do. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is teach you guys how to set up audio inside of After Effects and how to work with audio. Um, nothing like too in depth, just generalization of how to insert audio into your videos and maybe what kind of levels you want to look for. The, then we're going to go ahead and break down the video's visualizations and we're going to start with the first scene and we're going to learn how to work with two and a half D kind of like we did for the robot shadow, but we're going to be using the wings, right? So we're going to be creating the layers as 3D layers and we're going to be animating them in like our third dimension and then um, we're going to move on to the second scene where I'm going to teach you guys about um, animating along a path and using trim baths and we're going to do that map scene and then hopefully we'll get to the third scene today which is like the kaleidoscope of butterflies but if we don't um, based on the information that I give you guys today about how to animate along a path you guys will be able to um, animate a kaleidoscope of butterflies and so maybe we'll just kind of get to that one a little bit uh, should I don't know if we'll do that right away but we'll get something down here so it might not be the entire scene we work on today but we'll get something going so uh the first thing I want to talk to you guys is about well first of all I have my whole project set up here where I have um everything imported in, that I'm going to use right now into my after Effects project. So I have the audio, I have the um, music there, and then the voiceover. I also have my illustrator files put into here. And then finally, I have um, my comp folder. I just created a main composition. The other thing I want to do was look for real quick. Hey, what's up, Audrey? How are you today? What are you guys going to be doing for Halloween? Anything fun? Even if it's just... I like scary movie nights. I think those are fun. Even if it's just something like that. Uh, let me know I'm looking for something real quick. Cool. Yes, I want to bring this in. And then I've prepared a palette that I want to work with. Let's see if I can bring it in.
it should be on here. Where are you at? Oh yeah, pumpkin carving, super fun. Um, I am not quite sure what that is. Let's pull that up and look at it right now. Um, Audrey asked about the advising day inside of Slack. Let's kind of look. Uh... The Fall 2023 Advising Day. This is the first I've heard of it, so I'll have to ask. Uh, November 1st, 930 to 2.30, Fine Arts Building Room, FA 105. Come get help. Oh, okay, so it's getting help with, like, your schedules and stuff like that. Preparing for graduation. That's great if you guys are, are um, sophomores this year. Transferring university degree plans. This is all awesome. I won't be there um, because this interferes with my normal work schedule, but I would definitely recommend meeting with like some faculty and advisors and stuff. Dr. Farina might be, I don't know if he'll be there, but um, yeah, this is awesome. This would be helpful for you guys for the spring schedule, scholarships, all of this stuff is great. I know that, um, you know, when I was first going to school, my I was the first one in my family to go to a uh, secondary school or like a college, right? Um, at least in my immediate family. And when um, I did that, there wasn't a lot with that, which is awesome. Let me see here. I'm trying to see. There's a sign-up sheet as well. Here. This is a faculty. If you guys need to look down at the bottom, here's student sign-up sheet. And so you guys can go into here. And it looks like sign up for a specific time slot. It's pretty full, actually. So put your name in parenthesis next to student so we can travel. This is pretty cool, though. They didn't have this for me when I was back in at GCC a long time ago. But that's pretty neat. Yeah, thanks for asking, Audrey. If you want to know more information about that, just write me and I will um I'll get some more information on that for you, okay? I'm gonna try and put this in here now. Come on. What the heck? I don't know why it's not available, so I'm just going to open it up itself. But yeah, I have a palette ready to go, which I will open up here. And I'll have that off to the side. Hi, Seamus. Little dude, Are you joining in on class today? Okay, I'm just gonna do that for now. All right, so when working with audio inside of, oh my gosh, I don't know if you guys, this guy's crazy. I'm gonna shut my camera off anyway so you guys can see the full um thing, and then I'm gonna wrangle up my crazy animals. All right. So when working with audio, let's <laughs> just kind of jump back into it. Inside of After Effects, I want you guys to know that um, 
and I'll mention this again because I mentioned it on Tuesday's class, but After Effects is inherently bad at handling audio. That doesn't mean you can't work with audio instead of After Effects. We're going to now. But um, what happens is once you start adding, you can add the audio onto your timeline and it'll sound fine. But as soon as you start adding visual visuals on top of the audio, so animating and your illustrations, all that kind of stuff, it is going to prioritize the visual part of your project versus the audio part. And the reason I'm telling you guys this now is because it's important to get the timing of your audio set up first so that you can animate to the audio and then knowing that the audio is already set versus um, not having your audio already timed out and set in stone and then you go to animate later and you've got a very heavy animation and you're trying to do the playback live and it's not playing back your audio correctly and then the timing can be all off. So it's really important to get the audio imported first into a project whenever you're working with like a voiceover or animating to music. Sometimes you're just going to throw in music into a video that's just like an ambient background noise and it doesn't have um, as much significance as maybe the visuals, but that shouldn't always be the case, right? When we're Whenever we're creating um, any kind of animation, the audio has just as much importance as the video visuals. Um, and that's something that you'll get more used to as, as you work further on. You'll bring in audio and you want to start like counting where the beats are and finding where the, uh, you know, the timing is of the music so that you can have visual beats landing at the same time, which will really tie in the entire video together. Now, this one's not really going to need that as much as we're going to be tying in the the voiceover, right? Because the voiceover is the main part. Now, with that being said, audio is similar to text, right? When we talk about having text on screen, where I'm always saying to you guys, have it on screen long enough for someone to be able to read it like to be able to read it through and understand and comprehend what they're seeing when it comes to voiceover you want them to be able to understand and hear the voice right and so they can understand what they're hearing and so when you're layering a voiceover with music behind it you always want to turn the music down a couple notches in order to um, let that voiceover stand out and so I'm going to bring in the voiceover right now And all you got to do is I have it in my audio file. I'm just going to drag it onto my timeline here. And this is my main composition. That's where I want to keep the audio um, as far as where it is in which composition. I always keep it in the main composition. And the reason being is because that is like the main part where I'm going to be working with everything. Now, if I want to um, be able to turn the music up or down, audio is measured in let me see here let me see is always measured in any kind of these program in db and what does db stand for it stands for decibels and decibels equal loudness of of your audio now it's not the it's not the amplitude it's not the frequency it's how loud your audio is. And whenever you bring your audio, whenever you bring any kind of audio or music file or audio file into After Effects, it is always going to start at zero. Now, how do I access the audio levels, right? The decibels for this, for this layer here. What you want to do is you want to, there's a couple shortcuts and it's really easy to know. Um, The first one is L. I'll just type it in capitals, but you don't have to hit shift, right? It just has to be L. And that's going to um, allow you to see the decibel level. And if you hit LL, um, one right after another, that's going to allow you to see the waveform. And so let me go ahead and just, before I explain to you kind of what the waveform is, I want to show you guys how you can access those, that decibel. So I'm just going to select that layer and then I'm going to hit L on my keyboard. And all of a sudden you see this little section come up that says audio levels and a plus 0.00 dB. So it automatically comes in at zero decibels. That's fine. 
Now, a big thing with audio is if it's if it's properly captured, you never have to go over zero decibels. Um, let me type that out for you. Never. These are good for notes. Go over zero decibels. I'll type in BB. Um, that's pretty standard. I'm going to show you guys like an audio meter bar and I'll show you where in the bar you should have like voiceovers hitting, but um, you're never going to crank it above this zero. You'll always bring it below. Um, if you have to turn anything down, you're usually going to turn down everything else in comparison with whatever the voiceover is at, right? So when it comes to the music, um, I always like to turn it down, turn down to at least two notches from the V, V always stands for voiceover level, right? Um, now I, I've said notches a couple times. What are notches? Um, I consider a notch, this isn't a technical term. This is just kind of what I'm, I'm thinking it to be equal to negative 3D decibels, right? So if I say turn it down two notches, um, that would be negative six decibels. If I said to take it down four notches, that'd be negative 12 decibels, so on and so forth. So I just subtract three decibels from each time when I'm like, turn it down a notch or two, you're just gonna wanna subtract a few decibels each time. And usually that um, is a good measurement on where you can audibly hear the difference in it being turned down, right? And so I usually turn down my music at least a couple notches, 6 dB to 12 dB. And if the music is really loud, I'll turn it down. Sometimes I'll have to turn it down to negative 21 decibels, right? But um, the, the one thing that should always stand out is the voiceover. Now, let me see if I can get my audio levels up here. Audio. Now I'm going to go ahead and play this um, voiceover for you. And I want you guys to look over here at these audio levels. Now, whenever you're listening to a voiceover, usually you want it to land somewhere between like negative. 12 to negative three decibels is where you want like the sweet spot of that voiceover to be peaking. So um, a peak, right, is the highest level that it's going to hit. Sometimes it might peak up here, right? But as long as it's not constantly within this range, you should be okay. And so when I play this, you guys should be able to hear. Oh, that's the music. I'm sorry. I brought the music in. Let's bring that voiceover in. But it, you can see where the music's hitting. The music's sometimes peaking up to, I think, negative six, mostly. A little bit up there. There's where it gets loud, right? Starts to get really loud when it hits that, um, when it really gets into the meat of the song. Um, and so what I would do with this is I would turn this down to negative 12 decibels. And when I did that, you notice that these little faders drop down as well. So now when I play it, we're going to see that it's not going to go so high on our meters bar and you're not going to hear it. It's a little bit more subtle in the beginning. It's almost not even really registering on here. That's okay. But you can still hear it. And then the highest peaks are negative 12 at least, right? So, or uh, maximum was negative 12. That's a good standing point for, for the music for this, for this video that we're going to be doing. Um, let me bring in the voiceover though. I did want you, I wanted to use that example for the voiceover. So I'm just going to mute this layer right here. I'm going to play this voiceover so we can hear what the level of voiceover is at. I'm going to just hit L on each one of these layers so I can just see them. Every winter, Monarch butterflies migrate from North America to Latin America. Monarchs use a combination of air currents and thermals to travel thousands of miles. Now that, that audio is pretty good on its own. I don't have to turn it down at all um, because it's peaking really between 
pretty much, uh, I think maybe the highest I saw was around negative three to negative six and then um, negative nine. So it's peaking in just about the perfect spot. The biggest thing is you want to compare the voiceover with your music, right? The biggest thing that should be standing out is the, the voice. Whenever you're giving information, you want that audio to be more solely focused on the voice and where the music stands into the background. And so when I play them both together, they shouldn't compete with each other on who you're hearing the most of. If it starts to compete with each other, that's when you want to start messing around with the audio levels and maybe dropping the music down a little bit. So I'm going to play this Every for winter, you guys. monarch butterflies migrate from North America to Latin America. Monarchs use a combination of air currents and thermals to travel thousands of miles. So that was that one, in my opinion, was really smooth and very nice, right? It doesn't, um, the voiceover, you're able to hear everything clearly on what Dr. Farina is saying about monarch butterflies or what the voiceover is saying. And you're able to hear that music in the background, which gives it like this ambiance, right? And then the highest peak of the music happens right after he's done with the um, voiceover. Now, a waveform is a great way to see your audio so you can visually sync up your scenes, right? So so if I am hit LL, which is the shortcut to view the waveform, you're going to see all these like peaks and valleys along um, your timeline and where the audio is. And that's just the loudness, um, essentially like the decibels that are going up. This is the loudness and uh, the voice or the audio, whatever it is that you're hearing. If I hit it on the music track, you can see the same things happening here. And you can almost read a waveform, right? So if I were to look at this waveform here of the music, I can clearly see that there's going to be like some kind of slow general introduction to the music. And then it's going to hit here. And here's going to be where like the meat of the song is. If I even drag it further along, I can see that there's um, visual beats that are happening here. So if I play it right there. So there's like a dip in the audio that happens that you can read here. Um, so you can start to visually time your animations to whatever the audio is. For this specific video, I want you guys to have the beginning of the song um, I brought in the wrong one. I want the beginning of the song to be matched up with the voiceover because it, it happens kind of perfectly. You have to hit, by the way, you have to hit L quickly together. It has to be LL, right? One after another because if you don't, it won't show your waveform right away. But um, I want the kind of the softer part of the song to be lined up with the voiceover. And so um, it, it perfectly works out the way the song is because the the big beat that big boom of the song happens when the voiceover ends right so i want you guys to keep it kind of like this now uh let me see here i know there's something i'm missing that i wanted to tell you guys i just want to run through my notes real quick um but yeah this is real quick i want to just mention here that this is important being able to kind of see the waveform um, and visually mark out and map out your beats to the song is going to be important in the future because the audio becomes less reliable when you start adding in those visuals, right? Because you're going to see what I mean. You're, you're going to experience this as well as when you're playing it back. It's the sound is going to drop drastically in quality. And um, with this waveform, you can see like where the pauses and stuff are, where you can also plan things like maybe transitions, um, you can also go through here and let's, let's kind of mark, mark, mark out the sections on where the scenes will change once we bring that video and, and start, um, when we start visually lining things up. Now, something that you can do is if you hit control and you scrub your playhead, it's a shortcut to just just kind of quickly play. So if you're trying to figure out what does it say here, you can kind of scrub through that way. I know it sounds really funny, um, but that can be important later if you're trying to hear like just a snap or a pop or a beat that hits. Like if you're trying to 
match something up with a snare drum or something else that can be really helpful instead of having to go back and play North America, which can be harder. You can just America. You can hear that snap, that pop, and you can mark it out. Now, earlier in the semester, I showed you guys how to kind of mark out your um, layers, right? I said that if you don't have your any of your layers selected and you hit the asterisk sign on your computer, which is the little star symbol, right? It's this one right here. If you hit your asterisk sign, you can create a marker. If you're not selected on any layers, it will create a marker here on your timeline. But, uh, let me delete this one. If you're selected on a layer and you go through and you select that layer and you hit the asterisk, it will add that marker to that layer. And so I like to mark out my scenes right away. Um, let me move to the computer real quick. Or let me go over. I don't know why I said move to the computer, move into Canvas. I want to bring over the final video so we can map out the scenes. Lena asks, should there be a specific decibel level we should be hitting for the voiceover and the music, or do we just aim for the green for the voiceover and listen to make sure the music isn't drowning out the VO? I say that's usually the best part. Usually um, with voiceovers, you want it to hit between the negative 12 and negative 3. So as long as it's in between there, um, like I said, sometimes if people, when people are talking and they have clicks or pops or... Um, like S's or those mouth noises, they'll peak on the audio. What does peak? Peaks look like this, right? Where it's peaking really high. It's going up. It's shooting up really tall. And sometimes that will happen with the audio and it'll go into these levels. But in general, if a majority of the time it's between the negative 12 and negative 3, you're usually in a good green zone for the voiceover. And then I like to get the voiceover set first, and then I work with lowering the audio. So there's not necessarily a specific level um, for the music. It's just as long as it's not competing or drowning out the VO. The VO is the one you want to work with first, though. You want to make sure that that's the, that's the money, right? That's the thing we're trying to focus on in um, as far as, like, the audio goes. And... Um, I do highly recommend, here's what I was going to tell you. When you guys are working with audio inside of any kind of audio editing program or any video program that deals with audio, I highly suggest wearing headphones. Why? Because headphones are going to help you focus in on that audio. If you don't have headphones and you only have computer speakers to work with, that's okay. Just make sure that you're not... Um, you know, that your computer speakers maybe don't have a bunch of settings where you can crank up the bass and all that kind of stuff. You kind of want them neutral, right? In fact, a lot of music producers listen to the, they'll play the music that they produce on really crappy speakers. Because if it sounds good on a really crappy speaker, it's going to sound phenomenal on really good speakers. So um, it's okay if it doesn't sound, you know, the best on there, but you really want to get the audio levels um, or you really want to think about working with audio with headsets on. The other thing to think about is the volume of your computer when you're working with audio. Um, I really highly suggest, you know, down at the bottom, you guys can't see because this is my second screen, but usually down at the bottom of a PC, it has the little speaker icon where you can adjust your levels of your music um, or whatever you're listening to. I really highly suggest keeping your audio at 50% volume, right? So you know how you can go to zero and it's muted. You can go to 100 and it's max. You don't want it at 100 because then you're listening to it at your max volume, which means you're probably going to turn it down way more than it needs to be turned down. And if you're listening it to your audio at 50, like right in the middle at 50% of the volume, then usually that's a good tail sign of the how the audio is going to come through through 
to someone else because people are going to be listening to videos on different devices, right? They might be listening on their phone, um, through headphones. They might be watching it on a television with a nice speaker, or they might be watching it on a PC. And the one thing you don't want is you don't want the audio to be too quiet where they're trying to turn their device up really high because they can't hear it and you don't want it to be too loud so that their eyes are their ears are blown out right away right we don't we want to be considerate about what our audience is going to hear and so the first thing I would definitely do is uh, oh let me go over here what did I do where's my mouse hold on you guys oh here we go Lost my mouse for a second. The first thing that you guys want to do is check uh, computer volume. Then put on a headset. You guys could even be using like, um, like, I mean, I guess like a gaming headset or something like that. Something that's going to block the noise out from what you're hearing. I also, here's another thing you guys have to think about too, is because um, the newer headphones have the option where you can do ambient sound, where it pumps in the audio from outside into your headset. So you don't want that on and you don't want it blocking out all the extra sound, right? You don't want it to, you just kind of want your headphones to be kind of in a neutral place. So just making sure of that. And then, um, checking DB levels, level of VO first, and then checking the decibel level of music. So that's pretty much how the order of this should go into. Check your computer volume, wear your headset, check the decibel level of the voiceover, and then check the decibel level of your music. Um, let me see. Did I download this already? Yes, I did. I'm going to bring this into here just so we can see. Quickly, we're going to play this. I'm going to mute these. We're going to kind of map out. Every winter, monarch butterflies. All right. So after he says every winter, so the icon with the butterfly scales in, right? And he just says every, every winter. winter monarch. And then that butterfly scales up. And we're when he starts to say monarch butterflies, we're already into the second scene. Butterflies migrate from North America to Latin America. All right. Then there's that gap, right? We can visually see that gap happening here. So I'm going to go into my comp. All right. And because I have it muted, it's not going to show up. There we go. And I'm going to mark kind of where that transition is going to be um, to the next scene, right? So right here. Oh, I hit the wrong one. Right there is where that update's going to be. So here's going to be the first scene. So we can already see the first scene's really short, right? And then the second scene's going to be from one minute, seven second, or one second, seven frames to about six seconds, three frames, so almost about five seconds. And then we've got the rest of um, the scene here. So and then or we've got the last scene of the kaleidoscope happening here. And then after this is going to be your credits, right? And so uh, we can already start figure, visually seeing how long our video is going to be. It's probably going to be only about, because you don't need your credits to be that long. So we could probably end around 18 seconds here. I'm just going to hit end. I'm not going to trim the comp just quite yet. But I'm going to just assume, right, that th this is a good spot to stop. Might be a little bit longer depending on how long it takes to get the credits up, but it shouldn't be too long. And now we can start really mapping out the, or um, really start getting into creating the animation. Because we've already mapped out our, where the scenes are going to go in conjunction with the audio. And then also um, we've set the levels for our music here. The other thing I like to have you guys talk know about with audio um fading in 
Here, let me do this. Fade ins and fade outs. By the way, Nakara, I saw you in the chat. I'm sorry I did not say hello. What's up, dude? How are you doing today? So a fade in and fade out is exactly what it sounds like. Um, fading into the audio. So it's a nice like easing ramp from volume from nothing to to the full volume. And then fading out is the same. So you're going to fade out of your audio. I say you have to do this in all of your videos where you're using music. You should always fade the audio in and out. Sometimes you might not necessarily need to fade the audio in. Um if it's already got a nice transition into the song. But if the music doesn't last as long as the video is going to last, like obviously the music goes way beyond this here, we're going to need to fade out this music. But we're going to wait to do that until we're closer to the end of um, animation. So, uh, and then you just, well, let me say that you how to fade in and out is you just animate the decibel level. So I would just go in here and like if we were fading in here, we can do that. We'll say probably about right there. I want it to be at the this winter. Be. Monarch butterflies migrate from North America to Latin America. I'm gonna swear I turn this down. Monarchs use a combination of air currents and thermals to, to travel thousands of miles. Okay, yeah, made sure I hit it down. So we wanted to end up at the negative 12 dB, right? And so I'm going to keyframe that there. And then I'm going to bring this to the very beginning, bring the play into the beginning of the timeline. And I'm just going to take this and drop the audio down really far. So negative 80 should be plenty of a drop um, for this audio. And if I go like this, you're going to see that now it's really, really tiny. It doesn't even exist here. And then it goes up until like the actual audio there. So when I play it. Every winter, Monarch Butterflies. You can kind of hear it starting slow and then building up into the song. Uh, Nakar said, I'm doing okay. Somewhat excited for Halloween. How are you? Same. Somewhat, I'm excited for Halloween as always. Are you doing anything fun? Audrey is going to carve pumpkins. Super cool. It sucks because I'm from Michigan. So we used to be able to carve our pumpkins like in the beginning of October and it last throughout the um, kind of sometimes some of our pumpkins would last a couple weeks into November, but out here in Arizona, you have to carve them like the day before. Uh, so I've done the fading in by animating the decibel level to the music and fade out would be exactly the same. So if I were fading out right here, I would hit you on my keyboard and I would just keyframe that decibel level there a regular decibel level and then bring in all the way in and then negative 80 and you don't have to you guys don't have to ease these keyframes because you want it to be a steady consistent rate of like turning it down right so when i play it like this you can hear it get a nice fade out of the music instead of just being a hard stop um, because those hard stops can be kind of jolting when you're listening to audio. So we're going to create the first scene for here, which is going to be the butterfly flapping its wings. And the we're going to see Every here the winter, butterflies flapping its wings. Butterfly. And then it scales up on a screen, right? It's like an icon. So I'm going to go in here and create a new composition. And I'm going to say, name this scene one, underscore icon, butterfly icon. Okay, 19, 20, 10, 80, 45 seconds obviously is going to be way too long, but we can keep this like 10 seconds, like not even that, like five seconds. And the reason I'm doing this, right, is because I see how long it's going to take here. It's not going to take long at all, but I still want this to be longer because I'm going to use this um, 
flapping butterfly animation and something else. In fact, I'm going to make it 10 seconds. The longer sometimes is better when you're going to reuse something in the scene. And so I've got the uh, comp made. Let's go ahead and create a background. Let's, yeah, let's create a new background. So a solid layer. And I'm going to color it probably this color right here, which is the DECADC. I'm going to copy that. Interesting. There's no numbers. It's all letters. Cool. Pale magenta color. Nice. And I'm going to bring the butterfly illustrator files that I have. So bring all of these layers into my comp here. I'm going to lock that. And then I just kind of want to line these up, right? So the, I'm going to move them out of the way real quick or just hide them one at a time. Let's make sure that this body is pretty much centered with the composition. I think that it's a little too big overall. Everything's a little big, but we're actually going to pre-compose this butterfly once we have it set up. Um, I want the body of the butterfly, like, the main part to be kind of right here though. So I want to bring that anchor point up and then I'm going to show the antenna and I'm going to select that antenna Ooh. and do that. And I want to move the antenna to the proper spot, right? Because this is the left antenna and I want to bring the hit Y on my keyboard for the the pan behind tool or your anchor point tool. And I'm going to bring that down to the bottom of where the motion would come from that antenna, right? If that antenna is going to move around, it's going to come from the head. And I want to parent that to the head as well, or to the body so that, oops, wrong one. So that if the body moves, the antenna moves. And we're going to do the same with this wing. I'm going to turn this wing on here. And I want to take this anchor point and the motion of the wing is going to come from this section of the uh, of the the wing, right? It's going to come from this inside part that's attached to the body. And so I want to move my anchor point over there. And then I'm going to hit V for for the move tool. And I'm going to move this into place. I know that it's obviously getting cut off here right now, but we're going to fix that in just a minute here. I'm going to just shuffle it a little bit behind there. And then I'm going to parent this to the body layer. And I'm going to select that body layer and I'm going to scale that body layer down. All right. And bring that to the center. In fact, I am going to hit a line and I'm going to center that into the middle of my composition. I can bring up my title action safe here. And I'm going to hit, I'm probably going to increase the size of this 55 so it's nice and even. Hit P for position and then just kind of bring this down a little bit. So the center of the abdomen is centered in the middle of my composition. I'm going to hit Control S to save. Uh, probably just hang, handing out candy. That's what I'm going to be doing. I love handing out candy to kids. You know why? Because I scare them and I think it's funny. And it's the only time I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> Not be a weirdo. But I like seeing all the kids' costumes. It's one of my favorite parts. So we've got the butterfly all rigged up and in place. I am going to, let's duplicate this wing and the antenna. So I am going to create, let's go ahead and create shapes from the vector layer for the antenna and also for the wing. No particular reason specifically. I know, Lena, you asked there if there was a particular reason for that. And I'm just doing that right now um, just to just to just to do it because I'm used to doing that. You don't necessarily have to do that. But that way, when I duplicate these, I think that they will control D. Here's the let's rename this right 
antenna. I'm going to take all these outline things off. There you go, left antenna. Just renaming these so it's easier to read. Left wing. We're going to take this right antenna that we just duplicated, right? And we're going to go to the scale and we are going to unlock this and we're going to type in negative 100, which is going to mirror it to the other side. And then I'm going to lock that back up. And we're going to do the same thing with the wing. I'm going to hit Control D to duplicate. I'm going to change the name to right wing. And I'm going to hit scale on my keyboard, not ink a point, but scale. I'm going to unlock that and I'm going to type in negative 100. And that is going to duplicate that over there. But I still have to move this. This wing is still um, because it's mirroring it directly from the anchor point. So I'm going to need to shuffle this over a little bit more. So I'm just going to go zoom in on my scene here on my monarch butterfly. The I'm okay with the, these kind of are already centered with the monarch butterfly's head. So that's fine. But this wing obviously needs to get moved over a little bit more. So I'm just going to hit P on my keyboard and I'm going to shuffle that over on the X position and just kind of compare. It's not when I'm looking at the center of my comp, it's not too far away from here. So I just want to bring this over here, maybe nudge it over a little bit more, maybe 100. That looks good to me. Maybe in a little more, 98. And I'm just looking right here to see if they're about the same. I am going to, you can also grab these and oh, not caps lock, but holding down shift and make sure that align layers to selection. That's fine. And we're just going to align them vertically to each other. Just making sure it looks like this one needs to be moved in a little bit more. So 94. I just might type in 90. There we go grabbing the other one, just doing some visual lineups here. There we go. I think we're good. I'm going to save this. And so when you do this inside of After Effects, when you mirror your objects here, you're going to want to make sure that you move your anchor points first before you start mirroring your objects. Because if you don't, you're going to have to hope that your anchor points are lined up the same. But if they're not, when you start to animate the rotation of this wing, it's going to be obvious that your anchor points are in different spots versus moving your anchor points first and then um, duplicating them and mirroring the objects. The anchor points are going to be ex in the exact same spot on all the layers, right? And so it's kind of important to get those anchor points settled first and then do the duplication of the objects. I'm just going to move this butterfly over just a little bit more. Let's type this in 540. There we go. Perfect. Almost perfect. 960, 540. There we go. Let's save that. So you parented the wings and antenna to the body. Correct. When I parented, I the first thing I did, let's go ahead and write this out for you guys. So updated anchor points and then um, parented uh, wing and where's that one? Oh, does that not show up? Get out. That's crazy. Interesting. And antenna. Sorry, that's hard to read. To the body, right? Because the body is going to drive the motion of where the but butterfly is going to go. And then I duplicate. Duplicate. Wing and antenna. 
and mirror them. And then you always mirror them by um, you have to put negative 100 in the scale parameter, right? And whether you do that on the X or Y position will determine which direction it's going to mirror that object. If I would have put it into the X position, it would have mirrored everything in the wrong direction. And I would have noticed that right away, so I would have had to put that back at 100 and mirror the other one. But even if it's a negative in that scale area, if I go to scale that object and I relink them, right, if I still hit um, the lock, which is this little guy here, right? If I've relinked that, even if I go up or down, it's going to scale it in the appropriate way. It's just, it's just mirrored. And that's the easiest way to mirror an object inside of After Effects. Um, the next thing I want to do is because we're going to be working in that 2.5D, right, is I want to turn these layers into a 3D object because they're going to be moving in 3D. Now, I don't necessarily need the body or the antennas to be in 3D, just the wings because wings are the things that are going to be flapping. And so I'm going to grab both of these wings. In fact, I'm going to reach, I'm going to change the layer color of the wings and the antennas. And then the body is orange. And I'm going to turn these into a 3D layer. And you do that again by, this is the column for turning something into a 3D layer. I'm just going to check these two boxes here. And it's going to turn those 3D. You can put the other layers into 3D if you want to, but they're not going to animate in 3D right now. And notice again that little gizmo that shows up here on the layer is indica indicating that there's now an additional coordinate that we're working with, right? And so I'm going to hit, we're going to be rotating these wings. We're going to be animating the rotation. And so I just want to test this out to make sure which one I need to be rotating. It is not that one. So it's not the X rotation. And you want to make sure that you're not, you do not want to be animating the orientation, right? You want to be animating the rotation, any of these parameters, but it needs to be the rotation of the wings. And it looks like it's the Y rotation. So I'm going to set that back at zero. I'm going to move my playhead all the way to the beginning of the timeline, and I'm going to set a keyframe there at the Y rotation. And I'm going to do the same on the left wing because we're going to be rotating these equally. Because if you look at the video, I mean, the butterfly is, the butterfly is consistently flapping its wings, even if we come up, right? It's going to Every flap winter, a times. monarch butterflies and migrate it's even flapping from the wings North America here. to Latin America. As well, monarchs use a combination. And then we have the wings flapping there, and so I'm going to move back to that composition. We're going to select both of these wings, and we're going to hit U on the keyboard so we can see these. And I'm going to move up to about 12 frames. We can work on the, we can adjust the timing later, and I'm going to move these up so that it looks like the wings are kind of coming towards the camera and I'm probably going to just put this at 20 and I'm going to do the same over here but notice that we're going in the opposite direction from one wing to the other and that's because we have them mirrored and rotated and so I'm just going to go ahead and type in a, po a negative 20 here so it's just going to kind of be opposite of what each one is then I'm going to move head back in time and I'm going to set these back at zero. So I'm going to copy this keyframe and paste, copy this keyframe and paste. And then I'm going to move ahead another 12 frames. And instead of copying and pasting these two keyframes here where it goes to 20 and a negative 20, right? We want there to be a little bit of variation between these wing flaps. So they're not exactly the same during each one. If you watch a butterfly in the way it flaps its wings, it's usually, you know, they're not exactly equal flaps each time they do that. Um, you know, if they're sitting on a flower, for example, and you're looking at it, it's going to move its wings just kind of in an in a natural way, just, you know, maybe one flutter takes a second, dies down, and then another one.
kind of quick. So I'm going to make this one a little more subtle, right? And so I want to type in maybe 10 here. We'll do half and a negative 10 on this one. Make sure the wings themselves are equal to each other, but each flap is a little different. I'm going to save this right now. Wait, there's another way to transform right click flip horizontal inside of After Effects? Is that a new thing? Where's that at, Belle? Transform flip horizontal. They have that now? Get out. How come I've never known that? That's nice. Yeah. Okay, cool, guys. You can find them this way, too. Maybe a little bit easier. Whichever one's easiest for you guys to do. And then does this leave it? Um, and then the other way she was saying is going up to layer and to transform and doing it that way. Um, and maybe that allows it to be, uh, you don't have to have that negative in the scale. But I'm going to play these. Not too bad. I'm going to probably make this one. Let's make these ones actually a little bit more dramatic. So this one will be a positive. Let's see what 30 looks like. And a negative 30. Just going to kind of play these. Not bad. And we're going to want to ease these, right? So I'm going to hit F9 on my keyboard to easy, ease these keyframes. And let's go in here. Select them all. Come on. And we're going to go in here and kind of just exaggerate these. Let's pull these out a little bit. Holding down shift. I'm going to grab these ones here, drag this in, holding down shift. Do the same with this one, holding down shift, and then this way. I'm going to grab these last two, holding down shift and dragging out as well, just to kind of exaggerate those. Let's see how. Yeah, I like that. I like the way that looks. And we're going to use that expression that we worked on during the, um, when we did the robot arm and we did the assembly line. Remember the loop out expression? We're going to also use that here. And so I'm going to write, or I'm going to hit Alt, hold down Alt, and click on the stopwatch. And then I'm going to just start to, you can either go here and under property, there's the loop out expression there that you can click, right? And you can always copy that. If you right click on here, you can just say copy expression only. And you can go here. You'll have to select the parameter exactly and you can hit paste. Or what you can do start doing is you just start typing loop and it'll give you the option you can select that. And so now when we play this, The animation is going to continue looping, but let me just copy these end keyframes here so it settles back on the zero. Just need a little bit one because it kind of jerked back, right? There we go. So make sure you're beginning with zero. Remember to have the perfect loop. You want to have the beginning and end keyframes to be the same. But now we have this really nice, subtle looking flapping that's happening with the butterfly wings and and really not a lot of work that we've done we did this fairly quickly right so I'm going to save my work here I'm just going to double check on these the easing here of these keyframes I'm going to grab this one here and I'm just going to drag these holding down shift kind of in a little bit further and then grab these ones again here and drag them out so I kind of get almost like a matching curve happening from here and a nice smooth curve into that last settling of the wings there we go that looks really nice 
And we can add um, a shadow onto these, right? If we want to, by duplicating the wings and changing the opacity. Let me see if we wanted. I don't know if there was a. Let's see if he has a shadow in it. Yeah, he does kind of have a shadow on there. Looks like the shadow might have been. If we zoom in, yeah, we can do it that way. So let's go back to our comp here. And how do we want to do this? I'm going to select these both and duplicate them. I'm going to bring these to the very bottom. And I'm going to rename them both. Right wing shadow, left wing shadow, in fact, I could probably pre-compose this. Do I want to do it that way? <laughs> I'm trying to think of what I want to do. Let's try it this way. It might be cleaner the other way, and then we'll have kind of a shadow on the thing. Let's do it this way. Um, I mean, either way, it doesn't matter whether you can pre-compose this and duplicate the pre-comp or duplicate the wings separately and then um, use the fill, the technique that I'm going to do right now. Either way will work okay for you. But I'm going to go to my effects and presets and I'm going to type in fill. And I'm going to grab this fill and I'm going to drag it to both the wing shadows, right? I'm going to put it here. I'm going to change it to black. And I'm going to control C and copy this effect and paste it onto this layer here. And I want to probably. Maybe rotate it a little bit. Down like this. Let's see which way I rotated that. Did I change a rotation or was that the... It's the Z rotation. Just slightly. Negative five should be fine. Then do the same with this shadow here. If I go up to rotation, probably five because it's going to be the opposite. And then I want to let's change the color of these layers so I know what, that they're separate. I'll put these dark blue. And we're going to blur these layers. So we're going to go over here to our effects and presets and we're going to hit type Gaussian blur and we're going to drag that onto our shadow layers and we're just going to blur this layer out a little bit come on here just crank it until you see it's starting to blur it out we'll type in 40 and then we're going to duplicate this control C or copy and paste it to the next layer. And then we're going to change the opacity. So I'm going to hit T here. I'll probably drop the opacity down to 30%. Maybe a little bit higher. Maybe 40%. Ooh, not 403%. What, 40? There we go. Nice. And we have this nice little shadow underneath the wings. Um, and then we can add the shadow to the body and the antennas. We can always do the same technique like that, or you can do the drop shadow. So drop shadows, okay. It's not the best, but because these aren't moving, it's not gonna be that big of a deal. Um, so I usually will see over here and drop. I'll usually do this sometimes on text. And the one you want to use is right here, drop shadow under the perspective. Drop down. I'm going to grab this 
effect and I'm going to drop it on here which is the body and the angle the direction is going to be the direction of the drop shadow where it's occurring notice that because the um, well let me zoom in this way because the body is the top layer if I bring the drop shadow over this way you're noticing that this drop shadow is going to show over top of this wing as well so just kind of things to keep in mind when you're adding the drop shadow on I'm going to reset that I think that because these ones are kind of directly below I'm going to bring the direction of this down to 180 so it's almost like the light is shining above and down on the from like up above and down on the butterfly and then I'm going to, the distance is how far away from the object that this shadow is going to be. So if I move this up and I start increasing the distance, you can see that it's increasing the distance from the initial object it's going to be. I'm going to probably put this at maybe 10. And then the softness is going to blur that out as well. So I'm going to put this at 40. And I just kind of want to match up the opacity from this to the rest of the wings, which 50 seems to be working okay. And then I'm going to copy this effect as well. Select the effect, Control C, and I can select both the antennas and hit Control V, and it will paste both of those as well on. And there will be like a very slight drop shadow on those antennas. Maybe not as not as apparent but if I increase the distance you can kind of see where those drop shadows are at if you want to sharpen it up a little bit because these are really thin so maybe I'll put the distance as five on these the wings make sure or I'm sorry on the antennas and make sure if you're changing one on one you change it on the other and then I'm gonna the softness I'm gonna bring that down to like 20 do the same on this left antenna a little bit of a easier to see that that shadow happening there it's still a subtle shadow but it's there and then we have a nice shadow across the entire butterfly so it gives it kind of that feeling like it's there's some light in our scene as well I'm gonna bring that back and if I watch the footage again um, so there's a circle around the icon. We can do this one of two ways. So you could create a circle, uh, put it underneath all of your layers, and then um, just essentially parent the butterfly body to the circle so when you scale the circle up it will um, scale the butterfly as well but I'm going to use a masking technique in order to do that uh, the first thing I want to do is I kind of want to clean up my scene a little bit and so I turn my shy layers on and I'm going to just shy these shadow layers here so they're just not in my way I'm going to save this and Actually, before I do that, I'm going to pre-compose everything into its own, into a separate composition, because I'm going to mask out the composition itself. And so I'm going to hit um, shift Control c after selecting all of my butterfly layers. So all of the antennas, all of that stuff. It also showed, because remember, I converted these to shape objects, so it's giving me the original After Effects layers here. And I'm just going to throw that in there as well. And I'm going to name this to Monarch Precomp. In fact, I'm going to Monarch top down so I know which like direction I'm looking at it, kind of like the perspective that I have of this one. And I'm going to hit OK. Now, when you do this, in order for it to still have the 3D effects on there, you guys do have to turn on the 3D layer onto this precomposition as well. And so I'm going to uh, just turn that on by clicking that there. And then I'm going to organize my layers here inside of my project. So this Monarch top-down pre-comp, I'm going to drag that right in there. And we're going to go ahead and, because I want the circle to be this kind of purple color, 
right? This very soft purple. I'm going to go ahead and draw a circle, but I'm not going to draw a shape layer. I'm going to mask this out. So in order to mask something, you have to have a layer selected. It could be a shape layer. It can be an illustrator layer. It can be a pre-composition. It doesn't matter. The biggest thing is that you want this little button here. I know it's grayed out, and that's because I already have my layer selected, but this little um, button here needs to be in blue, which means you have this one selected. This is for masks. This one here is for shapes, right? So sometimes you're going to accidentally have the wrong one selected when you're wanting to do the opposite thing. Still happens to me. It happens to everyone. So just make sure that for this specific um, technique that I'm doing right now, you want to make sure that you have the mask selected and not the shape layer. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a circle from the center, holding down shift and control. So if you hold down control, it will increase the size of your mask from the center of the composition. And if you hold down shift, it'll do that all equally, right? Uh, I'm probably going to, before I do that, I'm going to scale this Monarch Butterfly composition down. Probably to 90%. And I'm going to draw that masked out shape. Shift, control, I'll go from the center. And right about there seems to be a good place for the mask to be. Now, the only other thing is I didn't add the um, background layer into this pre-composition. So I'm going to want to do that So I'm because um, it's not masking out the background layer and I want it to do that. And so I'm just going to select this background layer and hit Control X to cut it. I'm going to go into my pre-composition here, make sure my playhead's at the beginning, and I'm going to hit Control V to paste it and then just drag this layer down to the bottom. And so now when I go into here, it has masked out the background as well. I kind of want to have my butterfly more down towards the bottom because I want there to kind of be an equal distance between the top area and the bottom area. And right now there's kind of a lot of room here, like a lot of negative space. And so I'm just going to go down into my pre-comp here and I'm going to select that butterfly body. I'm going to hit P for position. I'm just going to drop that down just a little bit. Look here. You can use that technique I taught you in the last class where you lock this composition up. And then you open up the pre-comp and you do a side-by-side -side and bring this down a little bit. Just bringing it down until I find like a nice sweet spot where I like it. Ooh, there looks pretty nice. All right. I close this one. Unlock this. Save it. And... We're going to, now this scales up in the scene when we watch it here in the beginning, it's going to scale into frame. It's going to have kind of like a bouncing scale, right? And then it's going to settle and then it scales up and fades out to reveal the next scene. And so now that we have everything pre-composed into one composition, I can just scale this composition rather than having to scale like it my uh, a circle if I would have drawn a circle. So either way works. I just decided to use this technique. And so I'm going to hit S on my keyboard. And I want it to be scaled probably fully by this, the first 12 frames. Usually 12 frames is a good kind of incremental. It's half a, half of a second, so it's a good increment to work in, and then I can change that timing if I want to. And then I'm going to bring this all the way down to zero. But I kind of want it to bounce up, to scale up, scale a little bit bigger than I want it to, and then settle down into the correct position. So you can either add overshoot. Remember how we did that with the graph editor with your curves inside of your graph editor? You can add that overshoot that way. Or what I can do is I can move a few frames ahead here and increase the scale um, bigger than what this last one is. So this one's 90. I'd probably bring it in a little bit 
increase this to 100. So it's going to shoot up to 100 and settle down at 90. So it's got this little bit of a pop happening there. And I'm going to grab these keyframes and I'm going to hit F9 on my keyboard because we are going to ease them. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to adjust the easing on these curves. So let's kind of exaggerate this curve a little bit. And this one here, I'm going to bring up. And this one, I'm going to probably pull this out a little bit to exaggerate it a little more this way. So it's going to be a nice, like a smooth uh, motion into the full speed. And then it's going to slowly settle into that kind of that 100 scale keyframe here. And then it's going to be a nice slow curve and settlement into the um the full scale, the ending scale, which is 90%. So we've got this nice little popping animation that happens there. It's going to pop into frame. And if I want to just watch this over and over, I'm just going to shorten my playback time. And I can sit there and watch it, move this over a little bit. Maybe I want this to be smooth into this keyframe a little bit easier because right now it kind of settles a little hard into that last keyframe there the last scale value and I wanted to kind of ease into that a little bit more so I'm going to make this more of an S curve right I like that I'm going to save that work right there nice and I'm going to add a background on here. So do I want to do it in here? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Uh, let's just right click and add a new solid. And we're going to go into here and I'm going to grab this. Maybe this color here. Yeah, because I'll have the United States like a yellow color. This will kind of be the background color for this scene and the second scene. So I'm going to go in here. Add this here. I think you guys are a little bit more prepared for this project because of how much we did with the assembly arm project. We worked with expressions there a little bit. Nice. Okay, there is something happening here where the, let's see, this is getting cut off at the top. And why is that happening? If I click off, you can see and shut off my title action sequence. It's like a hard edge right there and it should be perfectly circular. Why are you doing this? No. So I'm going to just increase the size here. Oops, wrong way. Add an extra zero. There we go. Increase. We'll update the layer. Solid settings. Okay, we're going to figure out what's going on here. Put it back to regular. Shouldn't be doing that. 
because I'm not sure why the bounding box is kind of cutting that section off right there. Maybe if I take the mask. It's because I'm scaling the composition. So let me... There we go. Sometimes um, weird stuff like that can happen. <laughs> it It's just because um, I was scaling the entire composition, which, you know, that's an issue that I ran into because I made the choice to go down that, that route. Um, what you can do is there's an option under your mask. So if you select your layer and hit M, it will bring any masks that you have drawn on your layer up. And if you drop down this little drop down menu, you have an option to use a mask expansion. Now what that does is it's going to either expand or decrease like the essentially like the outer edge of your mask that you have drawn. So if I wanted this to go out beyond my mask, I could increase that number, but I want it to go to kind of shrink in so it doesn't get cut off on that bottom. And so I just dropped this down a bit. I So if I went up and positive, you can see how it's going to increase that. And the reason this happened is because I scaled my final the final size the where I animated the scale of the composition is at 90%. So it's smaller than than the actual main comp here, which is 1920 by 1080. And so that's the reason that that little edge was getting cut off there. And so if you just come in here and drop this expansion down, negative 15, you should be all set. You shouldn't run into that issue. And you'll be able to kind of mitigate that problem that way without having to redo things. So I'm going to swing that in. That's cool. And then I'm going to change the background color to, I think, shift control Y. Yeah, cool. That's the shortcut for that one. I'm going to do this purple. Copy this. Okay, put this down. I'm going to do this one. See which one I like more. Oh, that's nice. Rather nice. I do say so. All right, let's save that. And we're going to place this into our main composition here so we can line it up with the audio. So I'm going to take this main, the scene one, and I'm going to drop this down into my timeline here. And every winter, Monarch. I just played that here, right? And so now what happens next when it goes from this scene? Every winter, Monarch butterflies. The thing is, what I'm finding here is this Every scene winter, monarch butterflies migrate. is a little fast. Um, and you guys can choose to do this and you don't have to. But for my taste, what I want to do is I kind of want to push a little bit more space in between this first section of the VO and this second part. Just a tiny bit so that we get a little bit more time to appreciate the... Um, butterfly flapping its wings here on screen and so the one I want to do a couple things first what I want to do is I'm going to change the timing here of the scaling right I want it to come in a little bit quicker so I'm going to grab these last two keyframes I'm going to just drag these in a little bit so it goes it kind of quickly pops up on the screen might be a little too fast drag it back out So just a few keyframes difference. And then what I want to do is I'm going to split this layer here, this audio layer. And you split an audio layer the same exact way that you split a, a shape a shape layer. So you hit shift control D and it's going to split that audio layer into a second one. And then this one will have all the additional um, rest of the VO on it. And so I'm just going to take this um, one and just shuffle it over maybe a few keyframes or a few frames here so I get a little bit of a pause. Every winter, monarch, monarch butterfly. It's a little bit too long of a pause. I may just bring it in a little bit. I think if I hold down Alt, I can move it in. Every winter, monarch butterflies migrate. 
Every winter, monarch butterflies. Mon That's not bad. The other thing that I want to do is I'm going to hold down shift and grab both of these layers. And I'm just going to bring them in a bit so that the voiceover starts a little bit in, like about a half a second in, while this is animating on screen. So I'm going to play this. Every winter, monarch butterflies migrate. Nice. And I'm going to save this. So I just gave a little bit of a buffer space where this is animating on screen. And the first section of it plays. Gave a couple frames of a buffer here. And then um, it continues into the rest of it. Because what we're going to do next is we're going to prepare for the transition into the next scene. And what happens is this icon scene scales up and fades out. And we're going to do that by animating the scale and the opacity uh, but one thing I want to do before that is I'm going to take this background layer out of here and put it into my main to my main composition here drop that kind of down below all the visuals and so that when I scale this butterfly icon up and faded out off the screen I still have the background because I still might use this background color for the um for the map scene so every winter right about here is where I'm going to start my scaling I'm going to hit s and I'm going to hit t at the same time and I'm going to keyframe the scale and right about here 12 seconds again I'm going to scale this nice and big all right, almost too big, 550. And I'm gonna make sure I mark this as a vector, always vectorize. And then I'm gonna also animate the opacity at the same time. So it's all, like the opacity of the layer is dropping. So it's becoming more transparent, right? So I'm gonna start off with 100% opacity. And then I'm probably going to um, animate the opacity down at zero before it even fully scales. So when I play this, Monarch Butterfly, it's going to fade off the screen and scale up at the same time. Now, the big thing we're going to need to know here is after we animate the second scene, it is going to have to be placed under this first scene here in our main comp and below these keyframes so that as this is scaling up and fading off it's introducing the next scene from here and then beyond so let's go ahead and get into the second scene here we're going to create a new composition scene two map i'll just name it map <laughs> map of north america Hit OK. Lena asks, I don't remember if I asked this before, but how do we add markers to the timeline? You hit the asterisk button. So if you're selected on a layer um, and you hit the asterisk button, right, wherever your playhead is, it's going to add a marker. But if you're unselected off of the layer and you move your playhead around and you hit the asterisk button, it's going to add that marker to your timeline. And um, I showed you this guys before, but I'll show it again. You can split these markers up to kind of map out where your scenes are going to be. And if you double click on this marker here, you can bring it up and you can make comments. You can change the label color. And so when I do that, it'll give me just kind of an idea of what is where on my timeline. So you can either do that like that on the timeline itself, or you can um, do that specifically on a layer. So there's a couple different options there for you to do. All right, the next scene, let's see what happens. So as we're watching this, the butterflies are moving along the map. The map is scaling backwards. And there's also like this trail. Let me kind of do that so you guys can see the whole video. There's this trail 
of a line following behind these butterflies, right? So it's kind of showing this path that they're making along um, their journey migrating down south. Um, let me go ahead. One second here, you guys. Just one second. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's kind of set up this scene first. So we need the map of North America. And then we also need... Um, sorry guys, my brother's called me and he's on East Coast time and he never calls this late. So for a second, I thought there was an emergency. So I needed to answer that real quick and just send him a text, but everything's okay. Sorry, I was quiet. Um, anyways, so let's set this up. Let's bring in the map of North America, which I have already brought into my project. North American map layers. We're going to drag that on in. And I'm going to scale this up. This is a very detailed map of North America. You guys can choose whichever one you want to. I picked this one because I can update the colors. The other thing that I want to do is update the size of this composition. So 1920 by 1080. Actually, I'm going to leave it bigger because we're going to scale this composition. So let's leave it the... Um, 1920 by 2000 that'll be okay i'm going to save this i am going to right click and create a vector layer from this let's see how shapes from the vector layer let's see how long this takes because if it takes a long time perfect it did not take a long time i'm going to hide this map layer here clicking that and I'm just going to drop down into the contents. And if you do this, I can start to kind of see if I just hide all these layers here. I can start to see maybe where my background is because I want to update the background. There's going to be a lot of different. Let me undo that. I have a feeling it's at the very bottom. So I'm just going to scroll down here. Look how many layers there are. Tons and tons of layers, which means each, I think each stroke is separate. So let me grab this. Cool. That is my background. I'm just going to, I don't even have to delete it. I'm just going to hide that layer. I'm going to save this. And that color is very actually similar to the color in my uh, color palette here. So I'm just going to leave it. And let's drop the scene into our main composition here. Now, again, like I said, you're going to want to drop the scene below the first scene. And the reason being is because we're scaling this scene up and changing the opacity so that it eventually, once it's done doing that, it's going to reveal this next scene here. And so what we're going to do is shuffle this the scene layer, the second scene layer, down to where the beginning of the um, scale and opacity of our first scene layer starts, right? So it's going to reveal that map. And the other thing I want to do is I want to change this layer so it's just not the same color. And I'm going to shorten the length of this layer here. So I'm going to hit Alt Close Bracket on there, and it's just going to shorten that just so I don't have to see it reach all the way across. But I can always extend that if I want to, right? And I'm going to come in here, and we're going to start to animate those butterflies along a path. So a couple things to note here. When animating along a path, you're going to create a path with a stroke, and... The cool thing about After Effects is that you can copy that path into the position of another layer. So you can copy it onto the position of an, 
illustrator layer or you can paste that onto the position of a shape layer and let me just show you how we're going to do that i'm going to grab that pre-composition of that monarch butterfly that we had just made and i want to make sure that what's nice about this right is because i did the masking technique on this first scene here that I'm able to kind of mask this second one out here, but it's not scaling in. So I don't have to deal with the animation of the scaling of a circle. I've just got this blank pre-comp of the flapping of the butterfly wings. And that's what we're gonna wanna make use to make our second icon, which if you see here, it's the same thing of the butterflies flapping their wings with a circle around it and then just kind of like this outline, right? And so we're gonna create that in the second scene let's do that first i'm going to do the same thing i'm going to grab this ellipse tool make sure that the mask option is selected and i'm just going to go from the center of the butterfly's abdomen and i'm going to hit shift and control i'm just going to increase the size of that and i want to kind of move that mask up i don't want to move the butterfly in the composition on this one because I have it in the perfect spot for the first scene, right? Because I'm reusing this pre-comp. And so what I wanna do at this point is I wanna move my actual mask. So I'm gonna take this mask path and I'm just gonna arrow key it up until I get that in the perfect spot. That looks good to me. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a circle behind it so that I can have the outline. Uh, I'm going to select my ellipse tool. Notice now that I'm not selected on that layer. It's in the shape building mode. It's in the shape mode and not in the masking mode, which is great. That's what I want. And I'm just going to hit shift and control. I'm going to draw a circle a little bit bigger than the other one. And I'm just going to name this icon outline. And I'm going to change the color of this. What's the color of my background? Is this purple? So I'm going to want this to be not as bad. I'm going to drop this behind the Monarch pre-comp. Select both of these and align them to each other. Center, vertical. I'm going to make this a little bit of a smaller circle here. It's not centered out. Oh, maybe it is. It's not bad. Put it at 90. There we go. That looks nice. And I'm going to save that and change the color. Maybe to this one. Let's do it. It's part of my color palette. I don't want it to be exactly the same color as my wings, right? It's pretty close. I gotta select the right thing first. I'm gonna go to this properties, paste this there. All right, not bad. Let's save that. And now I want to parent the um let's parent the composition to the outline. Either way, if you parent it to either one, that's gonna be quick. actually let's do it the other way. Let's parent this one to here and I'll use this as like my main driving force the monarch icon so when I scale this it's going to scale that icon as well so I'm going to scale this down and now notice because I'm using that pre-composition that we already animated the butterfly wings I've got the flapping already happening here so I don't have to reanimate any of this I've already done all that heavy lifting the only thing that we have to do now is we have to draw some paths um, moving down the United States and then essentially attach this this composition to that path right and so I'm gonna take my pen tool and we're gonna create that path I'm gonna make sure I'm not selected on any of these Compos these layers and I'm going to actually hide this so I can kind of see I'm going to zoom in and in the VO it says my butterflies migrate from North America to South America so we're obviously going to start kind of in this upper region of North America 
and I'm just going to click and I'm going to kind of just create a line that goes down towards Mexico. And I'm going to shut off the fill on here. You can add a stroke just so you can see what's going on. In fact, you will want to add a stroke because we're going to add a trim pass to this. I'm going to increase the stroke size to probably 10. Why is this looking like this? What is this? Off. Um, my fast previews, I must have clicked that on. I just, that's why it kind of looked like that. Um, I just shut it off. Adaptive resolution. Wireframe. No, the, I'm going to shut that off. I don't need that on. And so I've got my first path created here. So I'm going to hit path one. Or I'm sorry, retype and rename this to path one. And um, it doesn't really matter where your anchor point is on this path at the moment because we're not going to be animating the position of the path. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to, you can either drop down your little menus here to contents, shape, and you can grab the path like this. Or what you can do, so a real quick way, is you can, with the layer selected, you can come up here to search and you're just going to type in path. And then it'll show anything in that layer that has the word path in it. It's going to show that to you. And we're going to select this path layer right here. This one specifically. You can't select this one or this one. It has to be the actual path itself where there's the little stopwatch to keyframe. And you're going to right click and or we're just going to hit control C. And what that's going to do is it's going to copy the path that we created. So it's going to copy this entire shape here. And I'm going to select my monarch icon that I created. I'm going to scale it down a little bit more so it's not so big, maybe to 20. And I'm going to hit P for position on this layer. And I want to select the position property specifically. You can't just grab the layer and hit control V. You have to select the position property and I'm going to hit control V on here. And what that does is all of a sudden you're going to see a series of all these little dots. These are tiny little keyframes or in-betweens that it has created to move this icon along the path that I made. And so if I, my key, my, my playhead was up above, um, it was further along my timeline, so I probably would have want to moved my playhead to the beginning of the timeline, but I'm just going to shuffle these keyframes here. And so now when I play it, that icon's going to move along that um, path that I created, which is awesome, perfect. That's really simple. It's a lot quicker than having to animate the position of that because you would not only have to, you know, animating that position might not be as easy as just creating a path and animating that. Now with this path, we can, um, it's on, remember layer order matters, right? So we want to take this and I'm going to drag it down here underneath the actual icon itself. And I'm going to kind of adjust this stroke here to be something more of what I'm looking for. So I'm going to make it rounded cap. I'm going to change the color of it to my palette color here that I have this yellow. Copy that. Come in here. And I'm going to paste that there. And then I want this to kind of draw on along this same path while this butterfly icon is animating its way down the screen. So I want it to kind of follow this icon, right? So I don't want it to be showing here, just almost like the icon is drawing it onto the map of the United States. And so I'm going to do that using trim paths. Remember we use that in our assembly line animation when we were animating the batter going into the cupcake tins we use trim paths for that we're going to do the same thing right now we just might have to adjust the timing of it of the um, trim path keyframes so that it follows along this path and i want to let's grab this path one again and let me i want to do a couple extra things here i'm going to Increase the size, I think, just a little bit. 15 looks good. I also think I want to 
you can always make it a dash line if you want, right? You can go down into the stroke options here and you can add dashes if I click on that and then I just increase the dash amount. I can create like this dotted line. I can offset the spacing here if I wanted to. Let's undo that. Put in an even number there. That's not bad. You can also taper them if you want to. You can kind of make your line wavy if you want to. We worked with those as well inside um, during our assembly line animation as well. So you guys can play around with how you want this stroke to look. But the biggest thing is we want to add that trim path. So again, selected on the layer, you go into the animation modifiers. And over here, you're going to select trim paths. And that's going to add like an additional little tab here. I'm going to drop down this menu and I'm going to animate it from the end to I'm going to animate the end keyframe here. Now, if you only wanted the a certain percentage of the line, right, you can always type in those percentages here. So if I only wanted there to be 40 percent of the line, right, I could do um, 60 percent here at the start and that leaves 40 percent between the 60 and 100 and so that's showing that only 40 percent of my line is showing here and then i can animate the offset if i wanted to you can do something like that um, but what i want to do is i want to just animate the starting position of this or i'm sorry the ending position of this line so i'm going to start it at zero here and i'm going to hit the stopwatch to keyframe that and then as this goes down I am going to increase this to 100 so now when I play it along it's going to look like it's drawing the um, path on here but we need to make sure these keyframes are eased so I'm gonna go in here and select these um, keyframe the actually the yeah, I'm going to select all of them. We're going to ease them. I think this one right here might be tricky. So again, these little circular keyframes are usually rove over time. It's just like a continuous animation that's happening of the, of the path, right? So I'm going to grab the position. Another thing here, real quick, I want to mention this because it just crossed my mind, is when you're copying the path to the position, you do not want to separate your your position parameters. You want to make sure that they're combined together, right? Because you're going to be changing. Your path might change from left to right and up and down. So just make sure you're not separating the dimensions here on your position. Um, I'm going to go back into here and I am just going to hit F9. I'm going to do the same here on my trim paths. And then I'm going to go into my graph editor I'm gonna grab these ones here oh come on I think I have to grab them both why does it do that ease them in ease them up Maybe these rove across time ones will be linear. Will that work? No, I'm not getting the. That's okay. Um, I'm not getting the little Bezier handle handles here. I'm not sure why. Has that happened to you, Bell? Where the Bezier handles don't show up if you don't separate the keyframes, or if you don't separate the parameters. Every time I do this, and if I don't separate the dimensions, it doesn't allow me to have my little bezier handles to adjust the curve, and I don't know why. It's like I have to separate the dimensions, but I can't... Oof. Oh, it makes me so nervous doing that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Let 
Oh. That looks okay. I'm going to grab the trim paths. Seems to be looking okay with the standard with the standard easing on these keyframes for the trim paths. It seems to be doing okay. What you don't want is you don't want your you don't want the keyframes to be of your trim paths to be further beyond where your icon is. You don't want it to really fall behind, right? And if my line were a solid line and not a dotted one, you'll see what I'm talking about. So if I go into here, I go into my shape, I go into the stroke, and I shut off the dash, right? Let's say I turn off the dash. You can see that the line isn't adding up, and that's because it's too slow compared to the icon animating along the path. And so what you want to do is you just want to move those keyframes along until it fully follows that icon. It doesn't really, it doesn't um, fall behind or go too fast. And we're going to kind of want to duplicate this a couple times. So I could almost pre-compose this. Do I want to do that? I almost split them. That's not what I wanted. I'm actually going to, let's scale this down a little bit more. And I'm going to duplicate these. I'm going to, first of all, pre-compose these two. Monarch uh, outline. Monarch icon with outline. Pre-comp. Okay. Recolor that. Perfect. And I'm going to create a new path. Let's do the same thing. Let's grab the pen tool. I'm going to create one from maybe somewhere in Michigan. Maybe it goes down there. Maybe this one is like that. And maybe this one comes from this way, right? Uh, making sure that you're not selected on the same layer. I'm going to rename this one first path two. And then I'm going to click off and I'm going to do it again with the third path. And I would repeat the process. So. Path three. Save this. Duplicate this. Bring it up above the second path. I'm going to move this one. I'm going to, well, first I'm going to select this path to layer and I'm going to go into my search bar and type in path. I'm going to grab this path right here. I'm going to hit control C. I'm going to go to the second Marnock icon. I'm going to hit position and I'm going to select that position. I'm going to hit control V. And the first thing I probably want to do is line up that icon for a second. And then I also have to make the hold on, let's undo this first. Let's grab this one. Oh, let's see if I can even do that because I did this before. Okay, let's backtrack here, you guys. This won't work. I would have had to pre-compose this first and then put that path animation on. So... Let's redo this real quick. Let me go into this pre-composition. I'm going to hit you on my keyboard 
and I'm going to delete this position properties and then I'm going to go here and I'm going to select the path so you guys get a quick view here I'm going to select this one of the first pass I'm going to path I'm going to copy it I'm going to go to the first monarch I'm going to paste it I'm going to hide this one so I don't get confused and then as I play this it should draw on that okay okay cool that's fine I'm going to hit F9 here nice and it worked just fine let me save that and then I'm going to do the same for the second one here I'm going to view this icon I'm going to move it over here I might take this anchor point and move it to the center of my icon I'm going to do the same for this one. So I'm going to delete this real quick. Sorry, guys. I am just fixing things as I notice problems, which are going to be similar problems that you will probably run into. So the one thing I noticed is that I want the animation, the animating along the path to happen from the center of the butterfly. So because I pre-composed this, the composition is, the pre-comp is the size of this entire composition, which I made, which is 1920 by 2000. That's okay. There's no problem with that. But um, I really want this to not animate from the bottom. And so I need to move that anchor point just kind of the center of my butterfly. And then we need to see where this path goes to. Cool. And I'm just going to, again type path here select that control C grab this hit position select the position per parameter and hit control V and so I'm gonna move these back over here so it lines up I'm gonna hit F9 on my keyboard there we go there we go much better much better and I'm gonna do the same for these next two so I'm gonna duplicate this pre-comp again, duplicate, bring it up here, hit P on the keyboard and unmark these position keyframes. I'm going to go to the path two, and I'm going to go to my search bar and I'm going to type in path. I'm going to select that path. I'm going to hit control C. I'm going to select the position of my second icon. I'm going to hit control V. And then I want to take the second path. We have to update it, right? So it's going to have rounded edges. We also need to add a trim paths to it. So I'm going to go over here and do trim paths. Drop this down. And I'm going to keyframe the 100. We're going to bring that over to the same timing right here. And then I'm going to bring this down to zero so that the path will animate on the same. And then I would also do that for the third one. For the sake of time, I'm not going to do the third one, but I want to see three on your guys's. And then the other thing I want to do maybe is add a drop shadow to these here. So I'm going to drop shadow was already typed into my effects and presets because that's what I used before. So I'm just going to add a little drop shadow onto this. The default direction is okay, but I'm just going to increase the distance a little bit. And then the softness, I'm going to double it. I usually always double the softness. Whatever my distance is, I double it on the softness. I'm going to hit Control C, and then I'm going to paste it onto the other one so that we have like this little drop shadow here. If you guys want to do that on the lines, you can do that as well. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to save this. And then while I watch this, this one is scaling out, right? And another thing you notice is that when the transition hits here to go to the next scene, the butterflies are still animating along that path. So you want to make sure that they don't really stop. You don't want them to stop before this transition happens. You want it to continue going. Like 
almost like we're in our mind as that video, as that scene keeps going, we're just imagining those butterflies continuing to migrate. And so we're going to drop this scene. We have it already brought into here, right? And so we kind of want to scale this. We want to start in high, uh, uncheck this. We want to start in tight, a tight shot and then scale it down. So I'm going to hit S for scale. We're going to bring this in and I'm going to bring this up a little bit as well too. And I think 175 should be good. Oh, that's way too big. And I'm going to select um, keyframe the scale. And then it's going to go down. And as it's going down, this is where this next transition is going to happen. Because remember, we placed a marker here on our audio layer so I already know visually this is where I need to make my transition so I'm probably going to continue to scale it down to its original 100% right about there let me bring that up a little bit so if, if I'm watching this monarch butterflies migrate from North America to Latin America now obviously those stopped so I have to go back into my scene and increase the length of these, right? So I have to go to all of these, hit you, and I'm gonna grab all of these keyframes and holding down Alt, I'm gonna drag these out about five seconds. And I also wanna remember to ease these right here, just hitting F9, keep one. And so now these are gonna be slowly animating. And while I'm watching them here, in my main scene. Every winter, monarch butterflies migrate from North America to Latin America. It's continuing to animate and here is where we're gonna do another transition to introduce the next scene. And the transition is gonna be very similar to what we did with the first scene with masking that composition. We're also gonna mask this composition um, we're going to add a mask using alpha mat. So an alpha mat is essentially like a shape. So, well, an alpha, alpha mat uses black and white to determine which part it is going to reveal of the layer below or above. Um, it's harder to kind of explain and easier to see. So I'm gonna take the ellipse tool and I'm gonna create a circle. It doesn't have to have a stroke. I probably just wanna fill just for visual purposes. Create a circle here in the center of the composition, probably like that. And I'm going to align it right here to the middle of the comp. And we're gonna to wanna to scale this layer up. So I'm going to rename this to circle mask. And I'm going to drag this over here to where monarchs use a this. Let's see, it stops right about there. I'm going to go back in here, adjust my timing a little bit more. Grab all of these. Holding down Alt, drag this to about six seconds. And then also do the same here. I'm just adjusting my timing as I'm seeing fit. I'm gonna drag this as well out to seven seconds. That's okay. And I'm gonna hit S for scale, and we're gonna scale this circle up. Anytime in between this, this blank area where nothing's being said. So I can even drag this a little bit further here. And I can start right here, be right about there. And I'm gonna start at zero. and animate the scale all the way up to beyond 100. We want it to be all the way. We want it to engulf the entire scene. 
and we're going to ease these keyframes real quick. Hitting F9, going into here. Holding shift, I'm going to drag that so it's going to ease nicely. Nice, that's a nice like looking transition all um, scaling of that circle, right? Because that circle is not going to be there. We're going to make sure that circle becomes like an alpha channel where it's like uh, it's transparent, but it's going to reveal. See what's going to happen here is it scales up to reveal the next scene. And so before we do that alpha channel thing, let's create the next scene. And I am going to go through this kind of quickly. If you want a more detailed view on that, I suggest watching in the module. You guys can watch um, the different techniques using parallax. Um, and we're going to add the wiggle to it. And you guys can watch a grass animation. But um, probably the end part of this right here. We'll also talk about this class from the past. Class from the past. This one right here. This one would be helpful just to get a little bit of additional information on this because I'm going to move through it kind of quickly. But I want you guys to know this information. Class might run a little late, but um, I want to get this in. And so I'm going to go over here into our project and we're going to create another scene. We're going to move this pre comp one into our pre comp folder. I'm going to go here and hit scene three underscore kaleidoscope of butterflies. 1920 by 1080 should be good here. And I'm going to create um, just quickly kind of like a little mountain scene here. I'm going to put in, let's do a background with this color. Maybe it's a night scene. Copy. Okay. New, solid. Do you guys have any questions right now in the chat while I'm doing this? going to lock that as the background and I'm going to take my pen tool and let's create the mountains in like I don't know we'll just use a gray color and I'm just going to start drawing some peaks Okay. Obviously, I would want you guys to take some more time and make this look a lot nicer, right? But oh shoot, let's not do that to this one. I'm gonna do it for my next one. A big thing when drawing in illustrating things in perspective, right? Let me see. You have to know a little bit about perspective in order to um, understand drawings, I guess, a little bit more. So when it comes to like perspective of mountains, right? So if you look outside and you're looking at the mountains, um, things that are closer to you are generally brighter and they're in more detail. Things that are further away from you are darker and blurrier looking. So if you look into the horizon, especially in Phoenix out here is perfect place to do so. And you're looking at mountain ranges and you're looking at ones closer to you versus the ones further away. The ones closer, you're going to see they're going to be brighter in color, more saturated. They're going to be in more details. So you're going to see um, different rock formations on those mountains. You're going to see maybe some foliage. Maybe you're seeing cacti. Maybe you're seeing 
um, some different like bushes and stuff. And then as you look further out and you see the mountain ranges that are further away from you, they're going to look darker. They're going to look less saturated and they're not going to have any as much detail. And the edges are going to be a little fuzzier. Right. And so keeping that in mind will help you to illustrate um, things later on down the road. Here is not such a big deal because it's not a super detailed drawing, like even the ones in the example aren't super detailed. But still, this are, these are things to understand about perspective that are going to be helpful, right? Like these mountain ranges in the front should be brighter and more, you know, detailed, like I was saying. And these ones, any in behind would be a darker color. Then notice here that there's a sun like a sunset happening. We've got kind of a gradient background happening, which I could do here as well. If I wanted to add a gradient onto this um, background here, I would just go into effects and presets and I could type in here gradient and the gradient ramp. You can do either four colors, which gives you gradients on four corners and you can move where those are. Um, but for something simple like this, I would just do a gradient ramp, which is just going to be the two color gradient, which you're used to inside of like drawing programs. And I'm just going to update the color here to this one. I'm going to change this color here and then I'm going to make this a little bit maybe darker here. And I want to move this kind of darker one up a little bit. If you grab, there's these little controllers here, which allow you to adjust where the gradient is. So if I want to bring this up a little bit further and bring this down and it'll make it help you see the gradient a little bit more. Maybe these two colors are too close to each other. There we go. That looks a little better. Nakara asked, I have to leave a little early, but thank you so much for class and have a good weekend. Yeah, you as well. And enjoy your Halloween, Nakara. I hope you have fun passing out candy to the kids. And we'll see you. Um, we don't have class on Tuesday, but we will have class on Thursday. And so that gives you guys a little bit of extra time to not only complete this, but also to complete those uh, the EveBot project as well. So I've got the mountains drawn here, and let's do our butterfly. So I'm not going to use the main butterfly icon scene that we used before. I'm going to kind of do this one from scratch. I am going to go back down to the monarch butterfly assets here, and I'm going to bring these back down into my scene. I'm going to go ahead and lock this background up so in these mountains so I'm not grabbing on them and moving them around. And I want to create the butterfly. I can use all these parts again, right? But I want to make it so that this butterfly is in a side view. I'm just going to move this one off, so the wing off screen. Um, but in this kaleidoscope of butterflies, they're in a side view and not in a front view, right? So we want to um, create this one a little bit differently. I'm going to take the body of this butterfly and I'm going to rotate it here. So the body of the butterfly is kind of on an angle. I'm going to move this um, anchor point up a little bit further. And then I'm going to take this, this antenna here. I'm going to move the anchor point down. And I'm going to hit V on my keyboard. And I'm going to drag that antenna onto the head of the butterfly as well. I'm going to parent it to the, the body. And I kind of want to draw maybe some legs on this one because we are in the side view. So I'm going to grab my pen tool and I'm going to go in here and maybe just draw a few legs. Oh, I'm on mask, so I need to click off there. Shape layer, I'm going to shut the fill off. No fill. 
we only want a stroke and we're going to change the stroke color to the same color as the body and then I'm probably going to do a little rounded cap but I'm going to taper the little leg a little bit go back into stroke I'm going to go to taper I'm going to taper the end length just slightly And I'm also going to go up here and select the rounded join so that it kind of rounds that little edge off there. And let's increase the end ease here. So it's a little fat little legs. And then I'm going to hit Y on my keyboard because I want to grab that pan behind tool. Let's select this layer. Rename it to legs. And move that little guy up here and maybe I would duplicate the legs if you want to animate them it might be better to leave these on separate layers and to duplicate it like this and then to hit V on your keyboard and move the other one here you can do that or what you can do is you can because you can still have separate control of animating them here but you can take the shape and you can duplicate it like that and then move it over this way and that way they're on the same layer but I'd make a, a few legs however many I think they have like four four little legs but I'm going to drop that below the body and then I'm going to again parent it to the body because the body is a driving force I'm going to save I'm going to grab this wing and I'm going to bring it into my scene and the first thing I want to do is I want to move this right there and I need to mirror this let's see transform flip horizontal and then I'm going to rotate this to kind of fit the body grab a V and I want this to be actually on the above the body right there not bad the rotation is negative 60 and then I'm going to parent this again to the body I'm going to select the body and I'm going to drop that down and probably I'm definitely going to scale this down as well and I think I'm going to increase this. I want the rotation of the wing to be there we go. That looks good. Two. All right. Fine with me. I'm going to save that. And the first thing that I'm going to do is duplicate. I'm going to turn this. Well, first, let's go ahead and duplicate this wing here. And I'd probably want to rename this to right wing. This one I'll rename to left wing. And this right one, I'm just going to drop below the body. And it's still parented. And I'm going to take both of these wings and I'm going to turn these into 3D layers. And I'm going to hit rotate. And we're essentially going to do the exact same thing that we did with the first one. So, but this time I think the wings will animate. Is this still the Y? Yeah, perfect. The other thing that I want to do is I want to slightly rotate the, um, which one's the right one? One behind. I want to slowly, I want to kind of rotate this one, not on the X, but the Z a little bit so that you can kind of see the wing from the other side. And the other thing, I think that should be okay. And now we're going to animate the wing flaps, right? So let's put these at zero. And we're going to keyframe, keyframe. I'm going to move up to 12. I'm going to bring this out 25 this one will likely be negative 25 
go back in, copy this keyframe, paste, copy this keyframe, paste, move back out. And then let's go to another, we'll do, what was this one? 25, so let's do maybe 35. Let's see how far that is. Yeah, that's not bad. 35, negative 35. And then we're gonna move another 12 frames, so we're gonna copy and paste those zero keyframes. Paste. Copy paste, and we're going to grab all of these and ease them and go into our keyframe editor here. We're going to grab those, only want to grab that, and only want to grab this one. Holding control down and grabbing those will allow you to do that. And then I'm just going to actually check this out. I'm going to grab all these center ones. And then I'm going to hold on shift and drag them in this way and drag these ones in this way. And then I'm going to grab these ones and holding down shift, grab these ones and drag out, drag up. Now when I play it, nice, not bad. I might change this one back a little bit. Let's see. just to five that looks a little bit nicer so maybe not um forward or if we do i think moving it backwards a little bit this back this right wing by rotating it back it allows it it, it looks a little bit more natural versus before having that wing forward looked a little wonky when i was playing it but we're gonna loop out these um animations here so i'm gonna hit alt on my keyboard start typing in loop do this again op select that loop out hit enter and i'm gonna do this just right click here copy expression only i'm gonna hit rotation here and i'm gonna paste that expression so now it's gonna just loop out the whole time Perfect. And you can have more of a dramatic um, wing flapping happening here since these butterflies are kind of flying along uh, a path, right? They're going to move along a path and they're going to be flying through the air and the wind's going to be affecting them. And with that being said, I'm going to scale this down a little bit so that we can get a few of these in here. And the other thing I want to do is I'm going to likely add I've at the end here, what I'll do is I'll pre-compose these together and add motion blur. But um, let's create a path that we can animate this butterfly along. So I'm going to go like this. On this path, we don't necessarily want the stroke on here. We just want the path, right? And I can go in here and I can adjust this path and have it look a little bit more like a, a smooth swooping Let's see here there we go nice and smooth change the name we'll select that type path in here and I'm going to copy this path and paste it to the butterfly position which Let's go ahead and pre-compose this butterfly first. Monarch, side view, pre-comp. And now I'm gonna take the position of that. I'm gonna move the anchor point first to the center of the body here. And now I'm going to paste that onto the position here. And so now when I play it, the butterfly is moving along the path. It's a little too fast, so I'm going to hold Alt and I'm going to drag this out. Um, and the other thing is that the butterfly is animating on the path, but it doesn't really rotate 
on the path so that it matches the direction it goes. Because really what should happening is as this butterfly is going up, it should kind of rotate to follow along this and then um, kind of rotate back down to go along this. And that's, that's called orienting itself along the path. And there's a way to fix this. And there's actually a shortcut, and I have it written down. I think it's Control-Alt. Oh, let me check. Yes, correct. So if you hit control alt o you can select orient along path and then what happens is the butterfly is going to kind of do like a little flip flop that's okay you just go on here and you hit r for rotation and you rotate it in the correct direction to be kind of facing along this path and so now when i play it the butterfly is going to spin itself to kind of animate along that path it's going to rotate its body so that it matches the directional pattern of the path. And what's going to, it's going to be normal that it's going to, when you orient along the path, it's going to kind of take your object and it's going to flip it upside down. Um, and that's just because it's trying to face along, I think, the way you drew the path. But that's okay. Like I said, all you have to do is come in here and change the rotation of it and it will just update it automatically for you. And the other way to get to that, if you don't wanna use the Control-Alt-O shortcut, is if you go up here to Layer, and you click Layer, and then down under, I think it's Transform, and then Auto-Orient. Auto-Orient, right there. Oh shoot, let me undo that. Or go back to here. Layer, Transform, Auto-Orient, and that will also orient your object. Now, what I could do is I could just take this Monarch Butterfly and I can duplicate him and I can scale him down to give variation and then I can move this butterfly. If I grab, if I hit P on here and I select all the position keyframes, I can move the path, I think, let me see. I have to find a way to select the entire path. There we go. And I can move it up. And I can update the shape of the path on here. Let me grab this again. Grab this one right here. I think what you have to do is you have to grab the actual keyframe right here and I can move this to change the path and update the path to give my butterfly variation. And that's just kind of how you create like this kaleidoscope of butterflies. I would go in here hitting you and change the timing. Of course you will want to ease these right because it's not going to be linear motion you're going to want to ease these keyframes f9 so that the butterfly see how this one kind of goes a little bit quicker and it follows along that path and you're going to just go through and you're going to just keep duplicating to create multiple butterflies on here um the other thing that you're going to want to do before you start duplicating and adding the butterflies, is you can add kind of like a random wiggle to the to the butterfly to give it like this um, kind of just like a jittering effect, right? And so what we're gonna do is we are gonna select this, and I think it wiggle Rama is in here. Yeah. Cool. We're going to go up to our effects and presets and we're going to grab Wiggle Rama. In fact, you can do this after you do the kaleidoscope. And when I threw that onto my onto my um, layer here, my pre-composition, it's going to add all of this stuff right here into your effects and, and controls for your different effects that you have on. And you can update this according to how you want it. Your speed is going to be how fast it wiggles. Let me zoom in here for you guys to see. The speed is going to be how quickly it wiggles. 
The nervousness is how much wiggling and noise is happening. The scale is going to be the rotation. The wiggle scale, I believe, is... Uh, I'm sorry, the wiggle scale is how big or small it's going to become. And if you don't want all of these, you don't have to have them all. Let me just kind of get out of here. One second, guys, my computer's frozen. Are you still with me, Lena? Yeah, yeah, you can always... Um, Finish the background afterwards if you want to. That's fine. If you want to just get the butterflies animated, um, you can go ahead and do that. That's It doesn't matter what order you do it in. And then what you can do... Oh, come on now. Why is this not doing this? This is being a pain. I'm sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, and you don't necessarily have to use the wiggle Rama. You can always just add like a position if you want to, but this one adds all of them for you. And so this works in pixels, right? Like if I put 100 pixels in here, this thing's going to move all around. It's going to kind of look like it's wiggling all over the place. And I don't necessarily want that. Subtle wiggling works better than anything kind of crazy. I don't really want the degrees to be so high, maybe like between 10 degrees of rotation. Um, I'd probably want to increase the speed of this butterfly's flying way too slow. He's definitely partook in some after school activities. <laughs> Let's see. That's not bad. That's a little fast, but, you know, the timing can be worked out on your guys' own. I would probably not bad. I might increase the timing of the actual wings flapping. So go into here and let's, like, cut it in half so they're flapping a lot quicker. That looks better. And so now if I'm playing it, it actually looks like they're flying along the path. But just kind of adjusting the scale, I'm probably going to put that at five because I want it very subtle. And then you can just copy and paste these two effects to um, any of the additional ones that you've created. But you want to have a bunch of these, these butterflies going at the same time. And then you also can retime them like by shuffling the layer, right? By like stacking and sequencing your layer will allow you to have multiple butterflies kind of happening at the same time. And if I go back, let's say I had a ton of butterflies on here. I'll just duplicate this one one more time and move this. Let's grab all these and move them down. We're going to move this back like this. I'm going to duplicate this one. Maybe move this one kind of in between here. I'm going to select the position of it so I can move this kind of back like this. You just want to make sure that they're all off screen at some point. So move this down. Maybe I select this one right here and move this down. Maybe I select this one and move this up. Just updating the shape of my path. And so I've got like this little kaleidoscope of butterflies. I'd obviously want a bunch more in here for you guys. And then I'd also like to see if you watch this video, you can see these clouds moving. Um, Casey's, you know, these are just going to be position animations and then dropping the opacity down. And you could also animate the sun if you want to, like a sun setting or a sun rising, for example. And I'm going to bring this um, scene into my main comp because I want to show you how to do the how to do that transition. So I'm going to bring this down here, not in here, into the main composition. Dragging it down here. And I'm going to push this over so that we have the circle mask happening. Oh, I accidentally added two of them. 
I want to drop this below the circle mask. So the circle mask is going to scale up and it's going to reveal this next layer. And so what I want to do is I'm going to, under the track map, I'm going to grab the drop down menu and I'm going to select circle mask because we already animated the we already animated everything within it. And so what that does is it puts an alpha channel onto this circle mask and it hides it. All of a sudden, if you look like it hides this layer and then it, you've got like these options right here. And what that does is it allows that circle animation to reveal the next scene. So as I'm playing it, Monarchs it reveals that next scene of air currents and thermals to travel thousands of miles. Where we have our kaleidoscope of butterflies. Very simple, super cool transition to use um, and really simple. And it only took like one click of a button, right? But the biggest thing is um, making sure that you're selecting the scene, the third scene, and that under here, if you don't have this track map option, you just go down to these little buttons right here and you're going to just make sure these two are expanded. So you're going to make sure that one is and then this one specifically, this one right here. We'll expand that and then you'll get this whole mode and track mat option. And um, the biggest thing is selecting the scene layer, dropping it down and selecting it to grab your circle mask that you make. You could also do any other shapes that you want to. I just did the circle mask. Um, so if you wanted to use the image of your butterfly to mask it out and do that, you could do that. All you would have to do is bring in the shape of your butterfly and um, scale it up and then just make sure that you're using that as the mask. And then you guys want to add like a scene at the end here um, that has your your credentials or the the I'm sorry my brain it's getting late and so my brain is kind of shutting down your credits you want to have your credit scene at the end I know this was a lot to deal with in class um, but you can now kind of start to see how stacking your layers and adding transitions can kind of build like this whole other video for you and the other thing I want to mention is to kind of sell speed of objects is by adding on that motion blur. So you're going to want to turn on your motion blur here and you're going to want to make sure that you're turning motion blur on anything that is moving. So in this one would be these scenes, which adds that motion blur to those wings and also to the butterflies as they're flying through the air. You also would want to add motion blur to this scene right here. And click that there. Let's see if it's yep, nice. You got that motion blur happening right there. And then let's see the second scene. We're gonna want to add motion blur still, even though they're not moving a ton, to the two monarchs butterflies. Turn that motion blur on, and then select the motion blur there. And so that's the motion blur is going to want to be something that you add very last because that's going to slow down everything a lot. But ooh, after all of that stuff, we have a whole three scene animation animated to a voiceover. Every winter, monarch butterflies Adding migrate audio from North America to Latin America. Our music. Monarchs use a combination of air currents and thermals to travel thousands of miles. Oh, miles right there about oh that's what i'm talking about where your audio starts to dip thousands of miles you can hear what i'm saying it sounds a little demonic and <laughs> appropriate for the time of year it is right now but um that's what i meant by after effects will prioritize your visuals versus the audio. And so when it starts to like lag on the audio like that, it becomes harder to work with um, animating to 
the timing of the music or the voiceover. And that's why it's really important to get that voiceover and the audio set up first and then bringing in those visuals. But yeah, big class, lots of stuff to do, lots of stuff to know. Um, do you guys have any questions right now about this? The biggest thing in this scene, which I didn't get to do, um, was obviously adding more butterflies and adding more detail to the background. I want to see in your guys' um, much more detail in the background of this of this scene. Like, I, I mean, there's obviously not a ton of detail in this one. There's just clouds and the mountains have details on them, which is nice. Um, some gradients within the background and then also on the sun which is cool. So that's kind of where I want you guys to focus a little time. Could we also bring it into Adobe Audition since After Effects doesn't handle audio well? You can do that. Um, but because this is just a very short voiceover and it's only a few scenes, there's no need to bring it into Adobe Audition. But Adobe Audition does have the option to bring in video to watch it but the problem is is we are animating with the audio and so I'm just using it in here um to kind of be the placeholder on where I need the scenes to be um versus I think in audition you have to have a rendered video that's good. Bringing things into Audition would be good if you're cutting custom audio to your video. Like if you're doing custom music um, or, you know, custom like sound effects and stuff like that. I think that it's easier actually if you were to bring it into Premiere Pro and work within like bring your compositions into Premiere and then adding the audio in Premiere and then watching the playback in Premiere and updating any of the timing that you need to in After Effects because dynamic linking works really well between Ad Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects. And so any changes that you obviously make inside of your compositions in After Effects will translate over as well into Adobe Premiere. I'm going to close this out and then I want to just point out a couple things, which I'll leave announcements for as well. Do you have any other questions, Lena, before I end tonight's class? Or anyone else in the chat? Um, and well, well, okay, cool. Awesome, Lena. The um, biggest thing is just kind of paying attention to all of this stuff in this module. I know it's a very long module, so just kind of keep an eye on it as you're doing this. If you want a little bit of know how to um, do parallax for that last scene, I would watch this section. You can watch this on a little bit more detailed about adding the wiggle. If you want to add grass, um, I show how to animate grass in this video as well. Um, and just kind of a little bit more of a detail from sections of different classes where there was a little bit more time. The other thing I want to get, let you guys know is that for um, Monday, I am not going to have a... Um, I'm not going to have you guys have do a participation grade for next week because we're going to have Halloween off. What's up, Keith? Missed you, dude. Um, but because we're going to have Halloween off, I'm not going to make you guys have a participation grade. And then on next Thursday's class, we're going to go over the Eve projects and we're going to go over the Monarch Butterflies. But because we're not going to have that participation grade for next week, if you guys have questions, right, over the weekend or anything like that, even on Halloween, if you guys are working on that day, just ask, right? And then either I'll be available to help with that or um, Belle will be available or maybe some other classmates will be available to answer any questions. So don't be afraid to still ask questions just because the participation grade isn't up and going for next week. 
But I hope you guys have a great Halloween. Um, and I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe on Halloween. It gets kind of chaotic. So I just wanted to let you guys know that um, I appreciate you guys sticking around for the live stream. Staying a little bit later. Correct. No participation grade due for on the 30th. But you still ask those questions if you want to. That doesn't mean you can't ask questions. It just means I'm not going to give you guys an extra assignment. Yeah, happy Halloween. Um, So just next week, due by the second, is the Eve bot. I've been seeing all your guys' work in, in Slack, and it looks awesome. I'm super excited to see everything. And then also this one's going to be due. The range is going to be... um the 30th through the 6th. So as long as you guys get those in and then on Thursday, we'll be doing a review class for everything. And then I'll be talking about your first revision round on everything. Yeah. Thank you guys for class. Thanks for sticking around. You guys have an awesome weekend and I will see you next week. Bye guys. Ooh, I got a boo in the section. Sorry. I yelled peaked my audio and then I had like a smoker laugh afterwards that was great anyways I'll let you guys go I'm gonna go play some video games and scare myself tonight so bye guys <laughs>